what I want you to do is fill this card out tonight, if not right now, when you get home, and immediately tomorrow, put a stamp on it and mail it to somebody. Are there any teachers in the audience tonight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, if you have, if you have, yeah, this, this strikes me as an activity that an English class ought to be doing at least once a year, uh, maybe more frequently. You know, writing about uh, something about their heritage uh, as they learn a little bit about it, just a bite-sized piece on a card. Laughlin uh, and Father Lucy were, were two key individuals in, uh, in St. Uh, Joseph's uh, development. And uh, a third one was, uh, was Father uh, Thomas Wallace. Uh, Father Wallace was born in Summersburg, New Hampshire. He went to Holy Cross in, in Worcester, uh, and then up to Montreal for his uh, religious training. He was pastor at St. Dominic's in Portland for, for a spell, as well as a couple of other places here in Maine. Uh, and in 1876, uh, he was the, the became pastor of St. Joseph's. Uh, this is probably the most prominent uh, person uh, in, in the, the Catholic history of, of Louis Lomer, at least from, from an Irish perspective. Uh, Father Wallace uh, established the uh, uh, St. Joseph's School. Okay, he, um, he also served on the, the Lewiston uh, School Committee for, for 29 years. Okay, that's a long time to be serving on a committee, and, and if you've served on a committee that long, He's undoubtedly uh, been effective and, and had an impact. Uh, in fact, Father Wallace has a school named after him, a, a, you know, a secular school named after him on, on Main Street, okay, just, up, uh, just about across from, from the St. Joseph's School. Okay. Well, Father Wallace uh, had, uh, had great ambition, and it's, it's a little bit one side. My perspective on him is, is, is one-sided. Uh, you know, I'm Irish, and I uh, haven't done an in-depth study of, of him and how other elements of society interacted. Uh, you know, at the time that Father Wallace was here, uh, the French-Canadian population was building. Uh, there, there was some competition uh, between the, the parishes. Uh, you know, what little I've, I've, I've read uh, indicates that there, you know, there, there was some, some friction, and certainly and uh, some competition in terms of, of setting up churches and, and what have you. And that's a, a story that I'm not going to talk about tonight because I don't know enough about it. And I know the basic outlines wanted to organize their parishes differently than the Irish Catholic bishops wanted to. And there were some conflicts there. And of course, the local representative was uh, you know, Father and Father Wallace. Well, Father Wallace not only served uh, St. Joseph's, but he also uh, initiated the construction of St. Patrick's. Yeah, of okay. And in 1886, uh, he purchased a, a, the lot over, over on uh, Tates and Walnut Streets. In 1887, the, the cornerstone was laid. <coughs> and three years later, the, the church was finished, and the first mass was on Christmas Eve. Now, architecturally speaking, If you take a, if you become a geek like me and, and start looking at these things, uh, the church is laid out very similarly to the, the, the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception down in Portland. Uh, when you look at it closely, now, and in all fairness, there's, there's a fair amount of time between the construction of the cathedral and, and the construction of St. Patrick's, but they're, they're very similarly laid out. But on St. Patrick's, uh, the minor tower, uh, is somewhat larger than the minor tower on the cathedral. And the other difference when you look up close is that the, the major tower uh, on St. Patrick's sticks out in, in front of the main, main section of the church. I mean, it's, it's forward uh, of, of the church, so somewhat in, relative to the, to the cathedral, it's, it's aggressively forward. The cathedral's major tower is planted back in the, in the building. So it's, it's interesting to look at that. I mean, the, so the design of St. Patrick's is somewhat, uh, you know, somewhat more uh, aggressive uh, in, in terms of appearance than the, uh, the, the cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. One of the other 
and I don't begin to know uh, as much as I need to know about this church. Uh, last week, uh, Phyllis told me, uh, or are you Yes, Phyllis uh, informed me that the Lithuanian community actually had uh, masses in their language in St. Patrick's. So it wasn't just an Irish church, of course. Uh, and Polly, I don't know, maybe uh, did, did our folks on Polish side yes. go to St. Patrick's? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, so it was, you know, it was a multinational or multi ethnic parish, but. Uh, uh, so it's, it's got a lot of interesting stories. One of the neat things I learned along the way was that uh, was a, a, a Catholic tradition of if you're the priest that, that founds a church, you have the, the option to be buried on the ground, which of course Father Wallace was for many years. Initially he was buried at Mount Hope. Uh, they built the crypt uh, under St. Patrick's or in St. Patrick's. And, uh, and of course when the church was closed a couple of years ago, he was Moved back to St. Mount Hope. He's a widely traveled priest in the area. <laughs> uh, he's got a nice, uh, nice, nice cross in the, in the cemetery now. Um, yeah, Father Wallace. Uh, Father Wallace's idea was that he would serve two churches. So for for a number of years, he was the pastor both of St. Joseph's and St. Patrick's. Uh, and the, apparently the, the folks at St. Joseph's uh, got a little annoyed with this after a while and, and requested that they get their own pastor. And in, in 1894, that, that was the case. Father Wallace was uh, encouraged to plant himself at, at St. Patrick's. And uh, Father Butler uh, came from Ireland, from I think Valley Mooney, I think, uh, Ireland, uh, who became the pastor of St. Joseph's. Uh, and Father Wallace uh, continued his, his work and, and development with uh, at, at St. Patrick's. The building next to St. Patrick's, uh, the, what became the, the rectory was uh, apparently originally the uh, Albert Kelsey's house. You know, the, the Franklin Company agent who had uh, assisted uh, the, the, the Catholics uh, early on that, at the time, that was, that was his apparently his house, uh, which is just a, a neat, ironic twist or a, a sign of, of how things uh, got better over the years. The veranda uh, around the building apparently was put on in, uh, in 1913, uh, after Father Wallace had passed. And Father Wallace created St. Joseph's Parochial School. Uh, he had the uh, Wallace Secular School named after him, and he also established the St. Patrick's School, uh, the other Wallace School named after his parents. And it's a building that's uh, still in use today. It's uh, the St. Mary's Nutrition Center. And I'll give a plug for their winter market here. They'll be starting that up in November. Great show to go to, great atmosphere, live music, good food, and great vendors like myself. <laughs> It's a good time, truly. They, they, they produce really good, really good food there, so it's, I think it's the third Thursday through the winter. Uh, if you think of it, it's, it's worthwhile to go and plan on getting dinner there because they, they, they grow fresh, organic food. They come up with really interesting, really tasty recipes, uh, and it's, a, it's neat to see that sort of thing going on in, in a building with, with so much history. Now, the school was built in 1905, and it was designed by Coombs, Gibbs, and Wilkinson. And interestingly, the, the site on which it was built uh, on, the, on the corner was, uh, was uh, the Beers family's home, and more to the, to the left was, uh, was where the, the Universalist Church uh, used to stand, uh, the original Lewis and Universalist Church. So that building was, was taken down for the construction of, of this building. And the story is, is that this building was, was constructed by Father Wallace out of his own personal funds. And he named it the Wallace School after his parents, not himself. And there's evidence that supports that. Uh, inside the building, even today, are the, the portraits of his parents, uh, which is another good reason to visit the building. And, um, and they're, they're good sized portraits. I mean, these are significantly large paintings. So that's a piece of, of Lewis Novel history that's, that's still around. Neat details. In 
In 1913, the, uh, the convent right behind the, the, the school uh, was constructed from funds left by Father Wallace. Uh, Father McDonough uh, succeeded Father Wallace, and he, you know, he put the veranda on and, and built the, the convent. Uh, the, the nuns, uh, the nuns, of course, were, were the staff for the school, and they had previously lived in a building to the to the right of the church, uh, a wooden frame, uh, two or three story building that that you know has long since been been removed. I don't know what use that building is being put to. My wild acre dream is uh, is to uh, put a youth hostel in there so that uh, as folks come to visit our town, young folks, they have a place where they can stay for a reasonable parade. Are there any questions or does anybody want to add anything to that? Yes, ma'am. What about the chapel? When was that put in? The chapel. St. Patrick's? Mm -hmm. That I don't know offhand. Yeah, they do in the nuns' home. The yeah. rectory. Is that yeah. the rectory where the nuns were? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There's a chapel yeah. inside there? Yeah. Next door. Yeah. Yeah. Next door. Yeah. Next door. Yeah. Next door. Yeah. Next door. Yeah. I think that convent is now housing for the elderly. Yeah. Convent building. Yeah. I'll have to, have to check on that. I've, I've asked a couple of people, and they they told me it's just storage and whatnot. But uh... okay, well, I think going back to the donut, can you tell me how the donut thing got their name? Yeah, the donut things uh, got their got their name because when uh, they were they were a secret society, uh, and in you know way back when, and not really back that far, as uh, you know. Secret societies were, were popular, or was popular for societies to be secret. Uh, and when questioned about their activities or about their organization, the standard response was, I know nothing. <laughs> it's true, you are one. <laughs> okay, well, I'd like to, to finish up tonight with a piece of Irish literature. And I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's long and uh, but it's, uh, it's a piece, uh, it's, it's one of my favorite pieces. It's, it's a combination of, of older and somewhat newer uh, construction. It's called The Deer's Cry, and it's also called St. Patrick's Breastplate. And I'm not a, a literature scholar, certainly not an Irish literature scholar, but there are things that strike me uh, about the stanza. One of them, uh, I suspect, is The Deer's Cry, is probably pre-Christian, and uh, St. Patrick's breastplate will be very obvious uh, because it's very Christian. But uh, here it goes, if I can still read here. I arise today through the strength of heaven, light of sun, radiance of moon, splendor of fire. Speed of lightning, swiftness of wind, depth of sea, stability of earth, firmness of rock. I arrive today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me. Sorry, my eyes are going. Uh, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to ground me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me. And I can't read the rest. But you get the idea. A uh, very, very focused, very strong um, statement there. The first part is what I believe is probably. Uh, I mean, it's, it's demonstrative of the, the, the Irish connection with, with the earth and, and with nature. Uh, and the second part is, is much more of a strong Christian uh, uh, you know, faith and, and, and the, 